welcome back to Teen Story Share. This week we're continuing The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. And if you missed the past two weeks of reading, those will be linked down below. As a quick reminder, we last left Mr. Bilbo Baggins about to go to sleep with the dwarves and Gandalf planning an early start on their adventure to the mountain to retrieve their treasure from the dragon. But Bilbo is still uncertain if he's going to join them or not. Chapter two, roast mutton. Up jumped Bilbo and putting on his dressing gown went into the dining room. There he saw nobody but all the signs of a large and hurried breakfast. There was a fearful mess in the room and piles of unwashed crocks in the kitchen. Nearly every pot and pan he possessed seemed to have been used. The washing up was so dismally real that Bilbo was forced to believe the party of the night before had not been part of his bad dreams, as he had rather hoped. Indeed, he was really relieved after to think that they had all gone without him and without bothering to wake him up, but with never a thank you, he thought. And yet, in a way, he could not help feeling just a trifle disappointed. The feeling surprised him. Don't be a fool, Bilbo Baggins, he said to himself, thinking of dragons and all that outlandish nonsense at your age. So he put on an apron, lit fires, boiled water, and washed up. Then he had a nice little breakfast in the kitchen before turning out the dining room. By that time, the sun was shining and the front door was open, letting in a warm spring breeze. Bilbo began to whistle loudly and to forget about the night before. In fact, he was just sitting down to a nice little second breakfast in the dining room by the open window when in walked Gandalf. My dear fellow, said he, whenever are you going to come? What about an early start? And here you are having breakfast, or whatever you call it, at half past ten. They left you the message because they could not wait. What message? said poor Mr. Baggins, all in a fluster. Great elephants, said Gandalf. You are not at all yourself this morning. You have never dusted the mantelpiece. What's that got to do with it? I have had enough to do with washing up for fourteen. If you had dusted the mantelpiece, you would have found this just under the clock, said Gandalf, handing Bilbo a note, written, of course, on his own notepaper. This is what he read. Thorin and company to burglar Bilbo, greeting. For your hospitality, our sincerest thanks, and for your offer of professional assistance, our grateful acceptance. Terms, cash on delivery, up to and not exceeding one fourteenth of total profits, if any. All traveling expenses guaranteed in any event. Funeral expenses to be defrayed by us or our representatives, if occasion arises and the matter is not otherwise arranged for. Thinking it unnecessary to disturb your esteemed repose, we have proceeded in advance to make requisite preparations and shall await your respected person at the Green Dragon Inn, Bywater, at 11 a.m. sharp, trusting that you will be punctual. We have the honor to remain yours deeply, Thorin and Company. That leaves you just ten minutes. You will have to run, said Gandalf. But, said Bilbo, no time for it, said the wizard. But, said Bilbo again, no time for that either. Off you go. To the end of his days, Bilbo could never remember how he found himself outside without a hat, a walking stick, or any money, or anything that he usually took when he went out. Leaving his second breakfast half finished and quite unwashed up, pushing his keys into Gandalf's hands, and running as fast as his furry feet could carry him down the lane, past the great mill, across the water, and then on for a mile or more. Very puffed he was when he got to Bywater just on the stroke of eleven and found he had come without a pocket handkerchief. Bravo, said Balin, who was standing at the inn door looking out for him. Just then all the others came round the corner of the road from the village. They were on ponies, and each pony was slung about with all kinds of baggages, packages, parcels, and paraphernalia. There was a very small pony, apparently for Bilbo. 
Up you two get and off we go, said Thorin. I'm awfully sorry, said Bilbo, but I have come without my hat and I have left my pocket handkerchief behind and I haven't got any money. I didn't get your note until after 1045, to be precise. Don't be precise, said Dwalin, and don't worry. You will have to manage without pocket handkerchiefs and a good many other things before you get to the journey's end. And as for a hat, I have got a spare hood and cloak in my luggage. That's how they all came to start, jogging off from the inn one fine morning just before May, on laden ponies and Bilbo wearing a dark green hood, a little weather-stained, and a dark green cloak borrowed from Dwalin. They were too large for him, and he looked rather comic. What his father Bungo would have thought of him, I daren't think. His only comfort was he couldn't be mistaken for a dwarf, as he had no beard. They had not been riding very long when up came Gandalf, very splendid on a white horse. He had brought a lot of pocket handkerchiefs and Bilbo's pipe and tobacco. So after that, the party went along very merrily, and they told stories or sang songs as they rode forward all day, except, of course, when they stopped for meals. These didn't come quite as often as Bilbo would have liked them, but still he began to feel that adventures were not so bad after all. At first, they had passed through Hobbit lands, a wide, respectable country inhabited by decent folk, with good roads an inn or two, and now and then a dwarf or a farmer ambling by on business. Then they came to lands where people spoke strangely and sang songs Bilbo had never heard before. Now they had gone on far into the lone lands, where there were no people left, no inns, and the roads grew steadily worse. Not far ahead were dreary hills, rising higher and higher, dark with trees. On some of them were old castles with an evil look, as if they had been built by wicked people. Everything seemed gloomy, for the weather that day had taken a nasty turn. Mostly it had been as good as May can be, even in merry tales, but now it was cold and wet. In the lone lands they had been obliged to camp when they could, but at least it had been dry. To think it will soon be June, grumbled Bilbo, as he splashed along behind the others in a very muddy track. It was after tea time, it was pouring with rain, and had been all day. His hood was dripping into his eyes, his cloak was full of water, the pony was tired and stumbled on stones. The others were too grumpy to talk. And I'm sure the rain has got into the dry clothes and into the food bags, thought Bilbo. Father burgling and everything to do with it. I wish I was at home in my nice hole by the fire with the kettle just beginning to sing. It was not the last time that he wished for that. Still, the dwarves jogged on, never turning round or taking any notice of the hobbit. Somewhere behind the gray clouds, the sun must have gone down, for it began to get dark as they went down into a deep valley with a river at the bottom. Wind got up, and the willows along its banks bent and sighed. Fortunately, the road went over an ancient stone bridge, for the river, swollen with the rains, came rushing down from the hills and mountains in the north. It was nearly night when they had crossed over. The wind broke up the gray clouds, and a wandering moon appeared above the hills between the flying rags. Then they stopped, and Thorin muttered something about supper, and, "'Where shall we get a dry patch to sleep on?' Not until then did they notice that Gandalf was missing. So far, he had come all the way with them, never saying if he was in the adventure or merely keeping them company for a while. He had eaten most, talked most, and laughed most. But now, he simply was not there at all. Just when a wizard would have been most useful too, groaned Dory and Nori, who shared the hobbit's views about regular meals plenty and often. They decided, in the end, that they would have to camp where they were. They moved to a clump of trees, and though it was drier under them, the wind shook the rain off the leaves, and the drip, drip was most annoying. Also, the mischief seemed to have got into the fire. Dwarves can make a fire almost anywhere, out of almost anything, wind or no wind. But they could not do it that night, not even Owen and Glowen, who were specially good at it. 
Then one of the ponies took fright at nothing and bolted. He got into the river before they could catch him, and before they could get him out again, Feely and Keely were nearly drowned, and all the baggage that he carried was washed away off him. Of course it was mostly food, and there was mighty little left for supper and less for breakfast. There they all sat, glum and wet and muttering, while Owen and Glowen went on trying to start the fire and quarreling about it. Bilbo was sadly reflecting that adventures are not all pony rides in May sunshine, when Balin, who was always their lookout man, said, "'There's a light over there!' There was a hill some way off with trees on it, pretty thick in parts. Out of the dark mass of the trees they could now see a light shining, a reddish, comfortable-looking light, as it might be a fire or torches twinkling. When they had looked at it for some while, they fell to arguing. Some said, no, and some said, yes. Some said they could but go and see, and anything was better than little supper, less breakfast and wet clothes all the night. Others said, these parts are none too well known and are too near the mountains. Travelers seldom come this way now. The old maps are no use, things have changed for the worse, and the road is unguarded. They have seldom even heard of the king round here, and the less inquisitive you are as you go along, the less trouble you are likely to find. Some said, After all, there are fourteen of us. Others said, Where has Gandalf got to? This remark was repeated by everybody. Then the rain began to pour down worse than ever, and Owen and Glowen began to fight. That settled it. After all, we have got a burglar with us, they said, and so they made off, leading their ponies with all due and proper caution in the direction of the light. They came to the hill and were soon in the wood. Up the hill they went, but there was no proper path to be seen, such as might lead to a house or a farm, and do what they could, they made a great deal of rustling and cracking and creaking and a good deal of grumbling and dratting as they went through the trees in the pitch dark. Suddenly, the red light shone out very bright through the tree trunks not far ahead. Now it is the burglar's turn, they said, meaning Bilbo. You must go on and find out all about that light, and what it is for, and if it is all perfectly safe and canny, said Thorin to the hobbit. Now scuttle off and come back quick, if all is well. If not, come back if you can. If you can't, hoot! twice like a barn owl, and once like a screech owl, and we will do what we can. Off Bilbo had to go, before he could explain that he could not hoot even once like any kind of owl, any more than fly like a bat. But at any rate, hobbits can move quietly in woods, absolutely quietly. They take a pride in it, and Bilbo had sniffed more than once at what he called all this dwarvish racket as they went along, though I don't suppose you or I would have noticed anything at all on a windy night, not if the whole cavalcade had passed two feet off. As for Bilbo walking primly towards the red light, I don't suppose even a weasel would have stirred a whisker at it. So, naturally, he got right up to the fire, for fire it was, without disturbing anyone, and this is what he saw. Three very large persons sitting round a very large fire of beech logs. They were toasting mutton on long spits of wood and licking the gravy off their fingers. There was a fine, toothsome smell. Also, there was a barrel of good drink at hand, and they were drinking out of jugs. But they were trolls. Obviously trolls. Even Bilbo, in spite of his sheltered life, could see that from the great heavy faces of them and their size and the shape of their legs not to mention their language which was not drawing room fashion at all at all mutton yesterday mutton today and blimey if it don't look like mutton again tomorrow said one of the trolls never a blinkin' bit of man flesh have we had for long enough said a second what the hell William was a thinkin' of to bring us into these parts at all beats me. And the drink runnin' short, what's more? He said, jogging the elbow of William, who was taking a pull at his jug. William choked. Shut your mouth, he said as soon as he could. 
You can't expect folk to stop here forever just to be et by you and Bert. You've had a village and a half between yer since we come down from the mountains. How much more do yer want? And time's been up our way when yer'd have said, Thank yer, Bill, for a nice bit o' fat valley mutton like what this is. He took a big bite off a sheep's leg he was toasting and wiped his lips on his sleeve. Yes, I am afraid trolls do behave like that, even those with only one head each. After hearing all this, Bilbo ought to have done something at once. Either he should have gone back quietly and warned his friends that there were three fair-sized trolls at hand, in a nasty mood, quite likely to try toasted dwarf or even pony for a change. Or else he should have done a bit of quick good burgling. A really first-class and legendary burglar would at this point have picked the troll's pockets. It is nearly always worthwhile, if you can manage it. Pinched the very mutton off the spits, purloined the beer, and walked off without their noticing him. Others, more practical but with less professional pride, would perhaps have stuck a dagger into each of them before they observed it. Then the night could have been spent cheerily. Bilbo knew it. He had read of a good many things he had never seen or done. He was very much alarmed as well as disgusted. He wished himself a hundred miles away, and yet... And yet, somehow, he could not go straight back to Thorin and Company empty-handed. So he stood and hesitated in the shadows. Of the various burglarious proceedings he had heard of, picking the troll's pockets seemed the least difficult. So, at last, he crept behind a tree just behind William. Bert and Tom went off to the barrel. William was having another drink. Then Bilbo plucked up courage and put his little hand in William's enormous pocket. There was a purse in it, as big as a bag to Bilbo. Ha, thought he, warming to his new work as he lifted it carefully out. This is a beginning. It was. Trolls' purses are the mischief, and this was no exception. Here, who are you? It squeaked as it left the pocket, and William turned round at once and grabbed Bilbo by the neck before he could duck behind the tree. Blimey, Bert, look what I've copped, said William. "'What is it?' said the others, coming up. "'Loomy, if I knows. What are yer?' "'Bilbo Baggins, a burg, a hobbit,' said poor Bilbo, shaking all over, and wondering how to make owl noises before they throttled him. "'A burr a hobbit?' they said, a bit startled. Trolls are slow in the uptake and mighty suspicious about anything new to them. "'What's a burr a hobbit got to do with my pocket anyways?' said William. "'And can yer cook em? said Tom. "'Yer can try,' said Bert, picking up a skewer. "'He wouldn't make above a mouthful,' said William, who had already had a fine supper. "'Not when he was skinned and boned. "'Perhaps there are more like him about, and we might make a pie,' said Bert. Here, you, are there any more of your sort of sneakin' in these here woods, your nasty little rabbit? Said he, looking at the hobbit's furry feet, and he picked him up by the toes and shook him. Yes, lots, said Bilbo, before he remembered not to give his friends away. Eh, no, none at all, not one, he said immediately afterwards. What do yer mean, said Bert, holding him right way up by the hair this time. What I say? said Bilbo, gasping, and, and please don't cook me, kind sirs. I am a good cook myself, and cook better than I cook, if you see what I mean. I'll cook beautifully for you, a perfectly beautiful breakfast for you, if only you won't have me for supper. Poor little blighter, said William. He had already had as much supper as he could hold. Also, he had lots of beer. Poor little blighter, let him go. Not till he says what he means by lots and none at all, said Bert. I don't want to have me throat cut in me sleep. Hold his toes in the fire till he talks. I won't have it, said William. I caught him anyway. You're a fat fool, William, said Bert, as I've said afore this evening. You're a lout. And I won't take that from you, Bill Huggins, says Bert, and puts his fists in William's eye. Then there was a gorgeous row. 
Bilbo had just enough wits left when Bert dropped him on the ground to scramble out of the way of their feet, before they were fighting like dogs and calling one another all sorts of perfectly true and applicable names in very loud voices. Soon they were locked in one another's arms and rolling nearly into the fire, kicking and thumping, while Tom whacked at them both with a branch to bring them to their senses, and that, of course, only made them madder than ever. That would have been the time for Bilbo to have left, but his poor little feet had been very squashed in Bert's big paw, and he had no breath in his body, and his head was going round, so there he lay for a while, panting, just outside the circle of firelight. Right in the middle of the fight, up came Balin. The dwarves had heard noises from a distance, and after waiting for some time for Bilbo to come back, or to hoot like an owl, they started off one by one to creep towards the light as quietly as they could. No sooner did Tom see Balin come into the light than he gave an awful howl. Trolls simply detest the very sight of dwarves, uncooked. Bert and Bill stopped fighting immediately, and, A sack, Tom, quick! they said, before Balin, who was wondering where in all this commotion Bilbo was, knew what was happening, a sack was over his head, and he was down. There's more to come yet, said Tom, or I'm mighty mistook. Lots and none at all it is, said he. No burra hobbits, but lots of these here dwarves. That's about the shape of it. I reckon you're right, said Bert, and we'd best get out of the light. And so they did. With sacks in their hands that they used for carrying off mutton and other plunder, they waited in the shadows. As each dwarf came up and looked at the fire and the spilled jugs and the gnawed mutton, in surprise, pop, went a nasty smelly sack over his head and he was down. Soon a dwallin lay by Balin and Feely and Keely together, and Dory and Nori and Ori all in a heap, and Owen and Glowen and Bifer and Bofer and Bomber piled uncomfortably near the fire. That'll teach em, said Tom, for Bifer and Bomber had given a lot of trouble and fought like mad as dwarves will when cornered. Thorin came last and he was not caught unawares. He came expecting mischief and didn't need to see his friend's legs sticking out of sacks to tell him that things were not all well. He stood outside in the shadows some way off and said, What's all this trouble? Who has been knocking my people about? It's trolls, said Bilbo from behind a tree. They had forgotten all about him. They're hiding in the bushes with sacks, said he. Oh, are they, said Thorin, and he jumped forward to the fire before they could leap on him. He caught up a big branch all on fire at one end, and Bert got that end in his eye before he could step aside. That put him out of the battle for a bit. Bilbo did his best. He caught hold of Tom's leg as well as he could. It was as thick as a young tree trunk. But he was sent spinning up into the top of some bushes when Tom kicked the sparks up in Thorin's face. Tom got the branch in his teeth for that and lost one of the front ones. It made him howl, I can tell you. But just at that moment, William came up behind and popped a sack right over Thorin's head and down to his toes. And so the fight ended. A nice pickle they were all in now, all neatly tied up in sacks with three angry trolls and two with burns and bashes to remember sitting by them, arguing whether they should roast them slowly, or mince them fine and boil them, or just sit on them one by one and squash them into jelly. And Bilbo, up in a bush, with his clothes and his skin torn, not daring to move, for fear they should hear him. Okay, so we got a bit of a cliffhanger. Next time we'll read the rest of chapter two, because it's kind of a long chapter, so we're splitting it in half. So see you next week to find out what happens. Have a good weekend. Bye.